All right, here we go. Once again, it is that time betting you here at Odd Chopper. I am Ben Raza. That is Matt Gajewski, and we're here to talk all things college football, our third episode of the year in the offseason, getting you ready for what's going to be a fantastic season of college football. And we've got to talk national championship contenders. We're going to talk about conference champs, too, just our futures, who we are looking at, and some of the bets that you want to jump on before the season kicks off. Matt, last week we talked about the Heisman. How do you feel about this, Marco? You you had a formula of looking at the past Heisman winners, kind of identifying who has a chance. Do you do that same thing when you're looking at actual teams to take down the whole thing? It's a little bit harder with actual teams, especially when you're talking the national championship market. Historically, since the college football era, you're really seeing like five or six teams that are live to win it every single year. There's a little bit of volatility in there. A team like LSU can shoot to the top in certain years if they see extreme growth from a player, but that doesn't happen too often. So in looking at this market, I'm really trying to find the value. And then if it's not there, I'll look towards the conference championships, maybe teams that'll win their side of the division and not others. For example, like the Big Ten West, I don't really think it's wise to be betting teams from that side of the conference to win the Big Ten when you can just get better odds for them to win their side, which is a far more likely outcome. And the same kind of goes for the national championship picture too. A little bit trickier to evaluate, especially we're talking about team by team basis. If you have a good player that goes down with injury or something, that can be huge for these markets. Oh, there's no doubt about it. A lot's going to change. And that's why it's a double-edged sword with all these things. Buying early and trying to catch teams before some of that stuff happens, I think can be very profitable. You also can get uh, you know, the wrong side of a number and that's kind of the nature of the beast. And that's what we're going to do here. I want to get it right off the top though. You're just hopping in. I'm going to talk about Bet MGM. They're powering this show. A lot of people want and a little extra money for the bankroll. They have a great way to do it. It's very simple. Sign up over there. They're giving you 200 free dollars when you do it. What you do, use the link in the description of this video. Sign up, deposit 10 or more dollars, bet it on any MLB game. I just did a video on this very channel, giving my best baseball bet of the day. You can use that. Go ahead. Any team, win or lose, $200 in free bets credited to the account. That will come in handy for college football season. No doubt about it. All right. I think we know where basically all these videos start, whether we're talking about Heisman trophies or national championship contenders. Even though they're not the champs, they still kind of feel like the team to beat. And that, of course, is Alabama. Inside two to one uh, at most of the books that I saw, I see them at plus 180 right now uh, on DraftKings. And that's really the number I've been seeing across a lot of markets. Is that right? Are they the favorite, the rightful favorite? I think so. You just look at their roster. It's probably the best top to bottom. They were number two in recruiting this year, number six in the transfer portal. They only added six transfers, but they were all high impact guys. Jameer Gibbs comes over from Georgia Tech. He's a do-it-all running back, extremely good in the pass game. Jermaine Burton and Tyrell Harrell come over from Georgia and Louisville for the receiving core. Tyler Steen, one of the most coveted linemen in the portal, comes over. These are all guys that should start for them. On defense, they get Eli Ricks from LSU. Again, really high-profile players that are just plug-and-play starters, and they replace some of the players that they lost. So it's not only Alabama doing this through recruiting now. They're also getting high-profile transfers. Their offense is going to be awesome with the return of Bryce Young. I know they lost a lot of production, but, again, they get those transfers in. Every one of their receivers is a four- and a five-star recruit. They should continue to be – an extremely efficient offense, whether it's through the air or on the ground with Gibbs coming in. On top of Steen coming in from Vanderbilt on the offensive line, they also had three returning starters. So this is an awesome team. I think they are rightfully the favorite. As far as this line goes, inside 2-1, to one, plus 180, that's currently on DraftKings. It's in that ballpark basically everywhere. It's a little bit rich for my blood just because of the conference they play in and the division they're in. The SEC West is extremely difficult. And I don't see it getting any easier with Texas A&M recruiting at such a high level. Last year, we saw Alabama get knocked off by Texas A&M. And I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happens this year, whether it's Ole Miss or a different team. So the interesting thing is, listen, I totally agree. Their win totals at 10 and a half massively juiced to the over. They can, I assume you think, and we never know exactly, but I, I assume you strongly think that a one loss Alabama is still definitely getting in the playoff in basically all scenarios. Probably, you know, the, like the SEC is probably going to have a one-loss team that's in contention. 
So I don't really see Alabama losing more than that, but they would still probably have to win the SEC championship in that situation. Like if they're one loss, unless it occurs in the championship, I'm not sure they're going to get in either way. You know, like we generally see one team from the one of the four conferences or one team from four of the five conferences, I should say. Last year we got two. So unless there's an undefeated and a one loss SEC team, probably two won't get in, but we'll have to see. Schedule wise doesn't really stand out uh, to me, at least, you know, they play really difficult in conference. They've got Utah state, Texas will be an interesting game. I don't think Texas is ready uh, to tackle a team like this. Louisiana Monroe, not sure they're going to get it done. And then of course, Austin P. Um, I mean, it's typical. They, They play a lot of really tough games in the SEC West. They easily could be the one seed in the playoff. None of that would surprise me. The biggest issue I have, that I don't really like locking up money for less than two to one uh, on a team like this. You need a lot to break right. And I, I'm just not sure that there's screaming value. I don't think it's a bad bet, but it also doesn't seem like a great bet either. That My thoughts exactly. Let's move down. Uh, again, I'm, <laughs> the champs are not in second. It's Ohio State. Uh, a little better north of three to one. I see them at plus 320 here. Obviously, they've got all the talent in the world. They had some hiccups and Michigan and whatnot, but Stroud, Heisman contender, all the weapons on that offense, they just reload. They recruited an extremely high level. We know that the Big Ten, uh, you know, they're going to get a team in there. If you win the Big Ten, you're going to the playoff. What do you think about Ohio State in terms of the national championship? Yeah, heavy favorites to win the Big Ten. Ton of returning production, even though they lost Olave. And uh, the other name is escaping me. But anyway, Stroud is back. Yeah, Garrett Wilson, sorry. But Jackson Smith and Jigba, arguably the best receiver on that team. He's back. They have tons of production at other positions like Trevion Henderson at running back, four of their five offensive linemen. And the receivers that are stepping up got a little bit of run at the end of the year. Marvin Harrison had an excellent bowl game. Julian Fleming's been a guy they've used at times. And then they have four incoming four and five stars at receiver, not to mention the other players that are now redshirt freshmen and, and sophomores at the position also in that caliber, four- and five-star recruits. Their defense should also be better, I think. They're returning eight starters on that side of the ball. Last year, it was certainly their weakness, and we saw them exploited at times. But at the end of the day, they are still 23rd in pass rush, and they were still 48th in defense overall. With eight returning starters, I think that's a a spot where you maybe see them take a step forward, not to mention they added high-profile transfer Tanner McAllister, who should play maybe in the nickel, maybe the slot, maybe it's safety for them. It's going to be a good defense, which I don't see enough people talking about here. And in the Big Ten East, that should be enough to stop teams like Penn State and Michigan. So I actually like this line a little bit. It's still not great. I mean, plus 320, you wish it was a little longer, but I think it's it's viable. Open with Notre Dame, interesting game. They get Michigan in the shoe. Everything sets up pretty good. They're another team to me. Again, it's hard to project this out. A one-loss Big Ten champion of Ohio State is getting in the playoffs. So you have one loss to work with, uh, particularly if it's not to someone that is the Big Ten champ. you got to win the Big Ten. But I think they can do that surviving a hiccup along the year. And we've seen that happen. I remember when Rondell Moore's Purdue got them at one point. Like They can they can overcome that. The schedule doesn't seem daunting. They, As usual, I don't understand. They play like It seems like they only play home games. Uh, they don't hit the road unless I'm not seeing this correctly. They don't play a true road game until October 8th in, in East Lansing. That's ridiculous. They play four road games this year. Yeah. What, 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 yeah. And one of them is in Northwestern. So now we're down to three, uh, road games. So it's just, it's a pretty easy schedule. They do have to go to Penn state. That's never easy, but at the same time, I, I think Ohio State and the books say this over 10 and a half wins, just like Alabama is is north of minus 200. They are saying that more often than not, they have one or zero losses this year. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense looking at their schedule and their roster. We'll talk about some of the other teams in the Big Ten East today, but I think it sets up more than previous years, especially last year for Ohio State to come out of this region. The third team, there are three teams that are kind of right at the top, and then there's a big drop. Um, the champs, they're the last one, Georgia. And I want to ask you if they're maybe not getting the respect that they deserve. They lost a lot. There's no doubt. They're still inside of four to one to win the national championship. I see them at plus 380 here. 
Talk to me about the dogs. They got it done last year. Is there uh, a chance they repeat or are they poised to repeat? They did lose a lot on defense. I think that's the biggest thing we need to look at. They're only returning three starters. Five of their losses on that side of the ball were first round NFL draft picks. So it's going to be a reformed unit. There's no doubt about it. But overall, you look at their recruiting numbers, then the transfer portal, they're a team that still is going to be attacking this year. I guess I shouldn't say transfer portal. They actually didn't really do that. But he, on defense, they have an absurd amount of four and five stars coming in, double digits. And I think some of them are going to start immediately. And then you look at some of the other players, they got situational experience. Georgia is one of these teams that doesn't just go out there and trot out their starting 11 and have them on the field every single play. So this three returning starters is kind of misleading. That's just three full-time returning starters. You look at the rest of their team, a lot of them got playing time. So no, I don't think they're going to be the defense, the defense we saw last year, but I'm not sure the drop-off is going to be as drastic as some people suggest just because of how they play. Then on offense, I think you're looking at another ball control team. They are returning four starters in the offensive line. They have a pipeline of running backs and like defense, they rotate the players. So Kenny McIntosh and Kendall Milton both had a lot of experience last year, even though they, they do lose James Cook and Zamir White at receiver. Again, you're losing some production, but because of the injuries last year, so many of these guys saw playing time. Like Lad McConkey had to start at times last year. Donnie Mitchell, same thing. Kyrus Jackson. And now you might get Dominic Blaylock back from that ACL. He, he returned a little bit at the end of the year, very similar to Pickens, just a situational player. And then from there, I don't even know if receiver matters that much. This might be the best tight end room in the entire country between Brock Bowers, Darnell Washington, now Eric Gilbert's back with the team, not to mention they got a decent recruit in Oscar Delp. So to me, it comes down to can the defense play at maybe 90% they did last year? And then on offense, I'm just expecting them to play a lot of ball control, run the ball, kill the clock. And we saw that last year because they only had one game that finished inside single digits in terms of their margin of victory. There's no doubt. I watched a lot of Georgia football. Their second stringers played – it was, you know, the second half, it was just, uh, all right, that's it, because they would just get up by 30 points immediately. That will pay dividends. Over 10 and a half is very juiced to the over. I guess my biggest question here is that you can find Georgia at around plus 150 to win the SEC, or you could take them at plus 380 to win the whole thing. I know there are paths, we saw this last year even, where Georgia could make the playoff without winning the, the SEC, but I, I almost am more tempted to say, okay, if I want to back them, I'll just back them in their conference and avoid having to win the two playoff games. Yeah, that's a common theme we'll talk about once we get to the the conference winners. It's very similar to like the Big Ten West, where you don't necessarily want to back one of those teams to win the conference. Georgia's in the easy side of the yep. SEC, so they have a very, I, I guess, winnable path, we'll call it that. I don't want to say it's easy because there are live teams there. They have a winnable path to the SEC championship, and then you just need to win one game rather than three, theoretically, if you're going to be the champion of the SEC. So you're probably having to win that game and then winning the playoff itself. That's three games to take down the title. At you know plus 380, I'm with you. I'd rather bet them to win either their side of the SEC or just the SEC altogether. Yeah, and you mentioned that they get certainly the easier side. They get Auburn coming over and Mississippi State. Love not that. the worst yeah, not bad at all. The two um, worst teams on that side. Then they get Oregon, Samford. Ah, uh, yes, Samford. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't see a lot there. George is going to be in the hunt, there's no doubt. But I, I, if so far, let me ask you this, because we're about to open it up and get some big odds. If you had to take your money and bet one of the top three, where would you put that money, whether it's Bama, Ohio State, or Georgia? It would be Ohio State, and it's just their path is easiest to get to the playoff comparatively. Totally agree. You're still getting north of three to one. It would be Ohio State for me as well. Now, if it's not one of these three, you're going to get a nice payoff, and it really opens up, and there's one middle ground team that we're about to talk about, and that is the Clemson Tigers. They're about 10 to one. They had one of the most disappointing seasons of the big names last year. And it actually started against this Georgia team in that first game. They had opportunities to knock off Georgia and then it just unraveled the offense lost control. So I kind of want to ask you, where is Clemson? Do they have a quarterback controversy? We talked that a little in the Heisman video. Do you care about that before you place this better? Do you want to see who's named the starter? 
I think it's kind of reflected in the odds that they don't have a clear starter right now. I mean, 10 to one for Clemson is, we don't see these odds often. Even last year we didn't. And it all comes down to the quarterback. Will it be DJ Uwa Galilei or will it be the number one quarterback in this class, Cade Klubnik? And coming out of the spring, it looks like Uwa Galilei has the slight edge. This matters, but overall, I think Clemson might end up playing a style similar to what I think Georgia is going to do. That's just ball control, far more run plays than what we saw under the Trevor Lawrence era. They're returning four or five starters in the offensive line. Will Shipley's back, and they have some high-profile recruits behind him. Kobe Pace is a longtime veteran. Phil Maffa, he was another high-profile recruit in Shipley's class. And you look at their position of weakness on offense, is probably receiver. Joseph Nada might be the guy you're most excited about here. I mean, they do recruit very well there. So a player like Antonio Williams or Adam Randall could step up. Those are incoming prospects. But overall, I think Clemson's going to try to run the ball and then maybe use that time to develop Klubnik. Could be like a Trevor Lawrence, Kelly Bryant situation. And then ride their defense a little bit. If you look at the defense, they're returning six full-time starters. But a lot of these guys are really strong. So on their defensive line in particular, you have three players that were all ACC, four players, excuse me. So it's going to be a very strong defensive line. And if they can replace some of the production in their secondary, like Andrew Booth is gone, he's going to be a big loss. I think they're a team that could compete in the playoff. Now, they definitely have the easiest path to get there among this conference. Just roster-wise, you don't really have teams that build like this. So Clemson, I do think, is the deserved favorite in the ACC again. It's just, can they put together the quarterback position to actually be competitive once they get to the playoff? Or are they going to be a lame duck like Cincinnati last year? Poor Cincinnati. But, I mean, when we saw Clemson at the height of their powers, I'm not saying this line is reminiscent of that Watkins line, but that was really the strength of that team. That was one of the best defensive fronts I've ever seen. Uh, Even Georgia last year, that's kind of what they did. And this is going to be a very strong front, no doubt about it. Looking at the schedule, Seems more than reasonable. They're another team that's over under 10 and a half, slightly to the over, but I don't see a lot there. Notre Dame, Miami. I mean, if Clemson's a, a really legit team, they easily could be undefeated. I also want to ask you real quick, and I don't know if this matters. Do you think the co- coaching personnel in terms of Venables is something that we factor in here? Obviously, that was a staple of them. Or do you think that Dabo will have that staff ready? They replaced all of their coordinators in-house, so I don't think we're going to see too many changes. You never know, though. Like Those are excellent coordinators that are head coaches now, so it's tough to say, but they are in-house replacements. So as far as like stylistic changes, I don't think they're going to be drastic for Clemson. To to me, what it comes down to is like, can they shoot out with like Alabama? Can they shoot out with with an Ohio State? The teams that have elite quarterback play and can run up 50 points on you, like can't Clemson score that many points in a game of a playoff caliber? Could they score that many points against an Ohio State? And I'm not sure, just because the offense is a little limited with Uwaka Lale. Klubnik is an uncertain player, so at least with him, there's that potential chance, but I don't really see it with Uwaka Lale. Yeah, the good thing about it in the sense is that when they're going to need that, it's going to be a while. So there's a chance that, you know, the, the true freshman is not exactly a true freshman at that point. If he's playing, if he takes over, you know, and they're, they're not decimated, if he takes over and they're three and oh, but they just haven't looked good. He's going to have a while to get ready for that game. Cause in the season, I don't see a ton, particularly early, like wake forest, Boston college is going to be good. Uh, I just even NC state, but they're in death Valley. I, I think that Clemson's going to be undefeated pretty late into the season and then we're going to see how good they really are yeah i think you could argue their three most difficult games are within their last four you're at notre dame so that's not easy for non-con miami they're probably the second best team in this conference and then you have a south carolina team on the rise just playing in the sec and that's the final game of the year so again similar to clemson i don't think south carolina is gonna be great early in the year because of how many transfers they have but as the final game of the year it's at least going to be somewhat of a test no doubt about it. Um, e- easy enough there. And I-, I think that 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 helps Clemson because they're going to be better as the season goes on. They don't have, you know, a team like Ohio State or Bama. They have stability. They know what they're doing. I think Clemson will get a lot better as the season matures. I know it's the offseason. I know it's not college football just yet, but it's rapidly approaching. If you are tuning in and checking it out and getting prepped, we appreciate you hopping in. If you want to support the show, hit the like button. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel. We have videos dropping each and every week, not just betting you episodes, 
short form, breaking down all the things that you need to know. And obviously, when the season gets started, we will have we're going to break downs of everything, every game, every max slate. It doesn't matter. You will be seeing us get it done and try to pick some winners that Clemson's 10 to one. Now it really opens up. You're talking about 30, 40, 50 to one type teams, Texas A&M, USC, both 30 to one. Talk to me about, uh, you could take either one. I, I kind of want to talk about UFC, USC and the UFC, but more USC. <laughs> uh, we talked about Caleb Williams last week for the Heisman. Clearly, if he wins the Heisman, USC is going to be a playoff caliber team at 30 to one. Is that almost not a bet on him to win the Heisman, but a bet that he's very effective in this Oklahoma West uh, can really be effective this year. Yeah, for sure. There's two teams, 30 to one AM and USC. I, I think USC's arguably the best bet here and AM's arguably the worst. AM for them, they have to basically beat Alabama, Old Miss in their side of the conference to be the representative from the West. And then they need to knock off Georgia from the East. Then they need to win two more games to win it all. So AM, I mean, like 30 to one. I would rather just bet them to win the SEC East if that's available to you, but we'll talk about that a little later. With USC, you have none of those problems. They play one of the easiest schedules in the country. Their non-con features, Fresno State, Rice, and Notre Dame. Notre Dame being a little more difficult, but again, they're starting a new quarterback themselves. And then you look at the crossover teams they play in the Pac-12, very easy schedule for them. Then you have everything they added. Lincoln Riley comes over, Grinch on the def defensive side of the ball. Williams, I think, already has proven a lot after he played with Riley last year. He was the number one overall transfer in this class, I think, for good reason. He's excellent mobility, solid passers, well completed, nearly 65% of his passes for 9.1 yards per attempt, rushed for 442 yards on the ground. Offensive line is pretty solid for USC, too. What they lose, they're replacing through the transfer portal and recruiting. So that's solid. And then on the, def the defensive side of the ball, only three starters return. But again, this is so misleading with USC because they have 11 transfers and three recruits that are four stars or better. So it should be a rehabilitated team. And maybe it takes a little bit of time. But overall, there's just so many good players that are entering this program. It's really hard to foresee anybody else in the Pac-12 challenging them outside of maybe a Utah. And I don't even think that those are the greatest odds. So th the first step here is how easily can your team get to the playoff for the first time since you know like 2015 i think the pac-12 has a really good shot at getting into the playoff here and that's the first step from there you just need to win two games so i'll take usc 30 to 1 so when we get to teams of this in this magnitude in terms of 30 to 1 50 to 1 i'm of the philosophy if you make the playoff i've done my job if usc if you bet them at 30 to 1 and they make the playoff and they play alabama and they get rolled I'll live with that at 30 to one. It's really a bet to me of does this team have a reasonable chance to just get in the dance? You got to win two games. Once you get there at 30 to one, I can live with that. And you know, they're nine and a half win total. I like the over on that. We've talked about that. I'm hope I, I think what they need is for Utah to be pretty good. If Utah is good and USC can get past them, they're going to have an opportunity to represent a conference that is definitely lacking in the conversation, they've got a, a high octane offense that's going to help them as well. I'll be honest, similar to Clemson, different reasons. I don't know what would happen if they played, uh, you know, they, they could be a team that gets into the playoff and plays in Alabama and plays a Georgia and is just not ready for that. But again, I'm willing to buy into that and, and find out on the fly. I, I'm OK with 30 to one as well. And I couldn't agree more. Texas A&M, if they win the national championship. It would be the most impressive. They would have like eight top tier wins uh, on the season. I couldn't think of a worse situation for a team. It's like Arkansas, just an awful situation to try to get through that gauntlet. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't see that happening. But with USC, too, you know, unlike Clemson, they have the guys on offense to hang in a shootout with Ohio State or Bama. Outside of Caleb Williams, they got two transfers at running back Travis Dye, Austin Jones. They, they both are. Other Pac-12 runners, too, so you're stealing them from your competition directly. Then they have four transfers of receiver. So on top of, like, Gary Bryant, who played well last year, and Taj Washington, who was a transfer in last year's class, they get Mario Williams from Oklahoma. They get Jordan Addison from Pitt, the Blitnikoff winner. Brendan Rice from Colorado. I would love to finally see what he has with true quarterback play because he did not receive it at Colorado. And Terrell Bynum, the same thing for him. He's another four-star at Washington who now is transferring to an offense that finally has decent quarterback play. So it'll be great to see what those guys have. And if one of them fails, great. Well, we have four transfers 
that are at least four stars or better. You don't need to play them all, which is, is going to be solid for this offense. I, I think they can hang offensively with those teams that really score 50 points in the playoffs. It, it's a pretty good situation for USC. Do you think, just real quick before I move on, can they stop them? Like, is, is, is defense going to be the big question mark for a team like this? It's tough. Grinch, he, when he started at Oklahoma, he had a really bad set of players. And then they slowly got better. And his defense improved every single year to last year. Now, last year's team corresponded with a slew of injuries. So I, I think there's kind of a pass here. You look at defense again, just three returning starters, but they have a ton of transfers coming in. 11 transfers on the defensive side of the ball. We thought they attacked offensive heavily. Defense is going to be a strength, I think, in the conference. It's just once they get to the better competition, can they stop people? I'm going to bet against it. I don't think they're going to be able to stop Ohio State and Bama from scoring 50. But, you know, hopefully they're good enough where they can bend and not break in some situations where that'll be what potentially gets you to the actual title win. As someone who backed Oklahoma a lot last year, uh, yeah, it was suspicious at times. The secondary was decimated. I will give you that. We will see. I tend to agree that they're going to have trouble up against those type of teams because you really don't want to get into – a back and forth, but those are problems that you can live with at 30 to one. Now at 40 to one, one of the more, I, I, I'm not saying this is my favorite bet for the national championship, but in general, I think one of the more intriguing teams in the country this year is Oklahoma because everybody's talking about USC. Everyone from Oklahoma in a lot of ways that was well known is on USC. So what remains of the Sooners? We just talked about Venables a couple minutes ago. Is this a team that's kind of just lurking and that if Texas turns out to be really good and Oklahoma still seizes that conference at 40 to one, is this a team that we should maybe keep an eye on? Yes, for sure. Again, first step, get to the playoff. Yep. Oklahoma has a solid chance of doing that. This conference is a little stronger than the Pac-12. So I think the chances are less likely. Again, that is reflected in the odds. They are 40 to one, not 30 to one. They lost a lot, but they get in a nice coach. Again, we, we just talked about Clemson, Venables coming in, and they have Levy at OC. So I don't know if we're I, – I think we will see a step down in terms of efficiency, but how much? I like Levy a lot as an OC, so I'm not worried about it too much here. From there, Dylan Gabriel coming over from UCF is a phenomenal transfer addition. I think he might be the best quarterback in the portal this year. I know everyone loves Caleb Williams, but he was the number three graded quarterback per PFF in the 2020 season last year. He got hurt. He's more of a pocket passer. But he also has weapons to throw to. The best receiver on Oklahoma is still there. Marvin Mims did not transfer. Theo Weiss is coming back from injury. Hopefully he can get back to form. And from there, they have a lot of transfers and high-profile recruits. Jaleel Farouk is a player getting a lot of hype. They have J.J. Hester from Missouri. L.V. Bunkley Shelton comes over for Arizona State. Really happy to see what he finally has in an offense that will pass the ball more than 30% of the time. And they got Daniel Parker from Missouri at tight end. A good receiving weapon there. On the offensive line, four or five starters return. They get a Cal transfer in McCade Medauer to round out that unit. Should be a good offensive line. And then defense, I think this will be better than last year overall. They're returning five full-time starters, but because of how many injuries they sustained, most of the players that are projected to start here already got starting experience last year, whether it was three, four, five games. I think that's important. And then when they're filling in the gaps, two strong transfers, Jeffrey Johnson from Tulane on the defensive line and Trey Morrison from North Carolina, both multi-year starters to kind of fill the gap here. So I do think they are the strongest team. Again, you're facing better competition like Texas, Baylor, Kansas State, Oklahoma State. Those are just better teams than what USC faces. But if Oklahoma comes out of this conference, I do think they have a shot to knock off an Ohio State or a Bama because they also have the dogs on offense for shootouts, which is something I think is going to be important come playoff time. This is a really interesting team because I look at their schedule. I don't see that much. If, if they beat Texas, I guess my biggest question is they, they strike me as one of the teams, and USC a little, but them even more. I think Oklahoma might have to go undefeated. That's my biggest concern. I don't know how good this conference is going to be. Uh, I don't see a lot there, though. I, I mean, if they can get past Texas, you mentioned Baylor, Oklahoma State, but they get these teams in Norman, and they're always extremely strong there. I'm not one for hot takes this early in the season, but Nebraska on the road, I could see that being a sneaky, difficult game for Oklahoma. If they can get past that in the non-con, could be open season. You mentioned that they bring in Gabriel. I don't think there's going to be a drop-off offensively. I think it's just a matter of ultimately how good was this team 
last year and this year, but the schedule to me checks out as a potential uh, pretty good setup. I agree with you. And, you know, last year was an interesting situation. You had an undefeated G5 team actually in the playoff contention for the first time ever. I don't think you see that this year. And, you know, if we don't have a strong G5 team. Could a two-loss team get in from one of these conferences? Probably. Maybe from the SEC. I don't know about the others, but they're certainly not going to put three SEC teams no. in. So I think you are drawing a little bit better for the Pac-12 and the Big 12 this year just because of the lack of G5 power. No doubt. I think the G5, and I'm a big like I'm a big Cincinnati guy, it wasn't great. I think if it's even close this year, they're going to be on the outside looking in because I don't think people were happy with how Cincinnati represented uh, themselves in a one-game sample. But that's a different conversation for a different time. You figure at least one from the SEC, one from the Big Ten. Then you've got you know the Pac-12, you've got the ACC, you've got the Big 12. Someone's obviously not getting in, but I think it's it's definitely open for a team like Oklahoma there. I mean, Michigan is, I, I do want to point out that Michigan is also 40 to one. They're in the same situation. I, we'll talk about this, you know, at the end, we're going to go over conferences a little bit. If I was going to bet them, I'd bet them just to win the big 10. I don't really like this number, but talk to me about what you see. Obviously they did take a step forward last year and then Georgia taught them a lesson in swift justice, but they did at least make the playoff. Yeah, the the line here is pretty different. When you look at them to win the Big Ten, it's plus 600 versus, you know, plus 4,000 to win the national championship. And I think in this situation, if Michigan actually knocks off Ohio State, you probably have a team that can compete with the other players. Other Ohio State's just so good. You know, I, I would rather take the long shot here. They do have some continuity at quarterback. Cade McNamara, he's back, but he's kind of a, a lame duck incumbent, more of like, I don't know what to call him, a game manager type. I would rather they give the job to J.J. McCarthy, but I don't see that happening. The offensive line has a lot to replace. Just three starters are back there, and then only four starters return on defense. So there's a lot to put together for Michigan, but we know they recruit well. They have some good transfers. If they can put it all together and end up knocking off Ohio State, I actually like this line a little better than them to win the the Big Ten just because in that situation, they're probably really good anyway. So 40-1 to versus 6-1, to I'll take the 40-1. to That's fair. You make a good case. Their schedule is really easy, but it, they're going to be, uh, you know, clearly to me, they're going to be, I'd say, around a touchdown or more underdog in in Ohio State. That's going to be a tough hurdle to get over. They're going to be boxed out if they don't win that game. I don't see any scenario where they take two Big Ten teams in the playoffs. So they have to win that game. I feel like every single path for them goes through Ohio State. 100% agree. Just like last year. Just like last year. And they got it done. They were at home. Uh, finally, that defense learned how to defend. But we'll see. I, I think that's going to be a tough sell for me. I'm a Michigan guy, but I, I don't really see it. All right, let's open it up a little bit. Because after that, I mean, there's big schools, there's no doubt. But it, it's a stretch. You, Notre Dame and Texas and you boys, Wisco, LSU, Tennessee, these types. How low are you willing to go? Is it a team that you have to see kind of like the Heisman, a path to victory in the sense? Or do you say, you know what, this team just has like a high, you know, like Tennessee, for example, really high octane. I don't think there's any way that they can get in the national championship hunt, but they've got a lot of talent. And I like their coach. Is that something you look at? How do you go about the long shots here? Yeah, I'm not willing to take any long shots in this market. Okay. They just don't win enough. Fair enough. Is there any team... I, I know we mentioned Cincinnati a couple of times already. Any team outside the big schools that you would do, or you're saying, you know what, they're just realistically, they're not going to win the national championship. Yeah, I wouldn't bet them. I would rather take them to win their conference. I, I, I'm with you. The one team, I'll give you one team. I think there is a chance. Everything we've said about Oklahoma, I still think there's a lot of unknowns. If Texas takes down Oklahoma and wins the Big 12 and Ewers turns out to be a Heisman contender, they've got Bijan. I don't think, again, defensively, it could be problematic, but I do think there's a chance that Texas makes the playoff. They're 55 to 1 in the national championship hunt. I could see that team being the representative from the Big 12, getting in there, at least getting in the dance, and I could live with that. I could see it. I, I think there's seven teams that are decently live to win this and max 11. 
The teams we didn't discuss at length were Texas A&M, Notre Dame, Utah, and Texas. I think those are the only teams in addition to the seven we talked about that could make it. Yeah, I. it's hard to argue. Like I said, I would love to give you a team from the clouds, but I, I really don't see it. Certainly, I assume that you don't have Cincinnati anywhere near <laughs> this radar. No, and, and again, to give you a reason why, like worst case scenario for Alabama, Bryce Young gets hurt first week of the year. All right, well, they have five elite offensive linemen in Jameer Gibbs. They probably just turn into a ball control offense and run it down the opponent's throw, control time of possession, and win with defense and still make the playoffs. So it's like even in chaotic situations, what does it take for – Miami to get into the playoff. What does it take for Tennessee to get in the playoff? But well, you need like six injuries, all of them to the starting quarterbacks for the best teams in their conference. So like betting Tennessee to win this market, you might as well just make a donation to charity somewhere and then write it off on your taxes. You'll make more money. Always donate to charity. Good people. Rain in particular. Shout out to Rain Charity. Anyway, I will say this. Uh, just to add to that point, say Alabama, say for some reason their entire team crumbles. It's just going to be another team in the SEC West taking that spot. Like then Texas A&M makes the playoff. Like it, it doesn't seem to open it up for new teams. It'll just be another representative from that conference. Ohio State, they finally go down. What did that do? It, it just got Michigan in. So I don't see room for these teams kind of in the ancillary pieces, unless one of them you're saying can take down Georgia in the East and then beat the West. I mean, that's a ridiculous path. I, I don't see that at all. Maybe something opens up, but the, the goal here at betting you is to obviously put down value plus EV, uh, try to beat these lines. And I just don't see that happening here. But that doesn't mean that these teams are irrelevant because I want to ask you, you know, we got we got a little time left, about 10 minutes. I want to ask you about conference bets, because some of these teams, I would assume you say, OK, they're not going to win the national championship, but they are live maybe in their conference. Is that something that you look to? Yeah, 100 percent. I actually think this market is probably more beatable just because you don't have to win as many games and you can capitalize on some information we already have. Where do you want to go? Because we've talked about the big name schools. I guess what I'd like to do and feel free, you can open it up. Are there schools that we haven't talked about in some of these conferences that you say, OK, again, not national championship contenders, but keep an eye on this team. You know, they're 10 to one to win their conference. And I think they're live. Yeah, for sure. It, it, and one conference I'll just immediately X out is the SEC. I would rather take the SEC teams in the national championship market because the lines are better. And if you get through the gauntlet of the SEC, you probably have a decent shot to win it all. But there are some weaker conferences where I think the representative that would theoretically get into the playoff might not be as strong. And one of those conferences is the ACC. It's a conference I really like because the favorite has quarterback issues and, and bad ones at that. And we just saw Clemson drop three games last year and box themselves out of the playoff. And, you know, they didn't even win the ACC. We could see that again this year. The ACC is interesting where it is. There's a dichotomy between the two divisions. You, you have the Atlantic, which is far stronger than the Coastal. So first things first, with the Atlantic side, you can find NC State plus 500 to win the Atlantic. That's just a bet basically that NC State is going to beat Clemson in season. But I also think that if NC State is strong enough to beat Clemson in the regular season and represent the Atlantic in the ACC title game, there's probably a good shot they win it all. And they're plus 1,000, so 10 to 1 NC State overall to win the ACC. This is probably the best NC State team we've seen in recent years. They have their quarterback coming back. They're returning four or five offensive linemen, multiple starters at the skill position players. And then on defense, they're returning 10 starters, and that includes five players that were at least honorable mention all ACC. And there were a couple first teamers in there too. Tanner Engel. And then on the defensive line, you have Durden, Cody Durden as well. Corey Durden, excuse me, not Cody Durden. Cody Durden's a UFC fighter. Twice we've done that. Now. <laughs> US but I'm telling you, we got fighting on the mind. Corey, Corey Durden. He's another first team all ACC player on the defensive line. So it's kind of the situation where I think it, in NC State, they don't recruit as well. They're not going to get a lot of transfers. They kind of need this perfect storm where they have a lot of starters returning and starters that have been developed into high quality starters. And we have that this year. So it could be enough, especially on defense for them to overcome a team like Clemson, who is a little bit of a lame duck. I think just because of the quarterback situation. And then you look at NC state overall, they don't have a difficult schedule, which is a huge component here too. 
I've been I was on the Wolfpack a little bit last year with their win total. The ACC is a weird. You've got Clemson, and then to me, you literally and we saw this with Wake Forest. You have Clemson, you have everybody else, and it's very interchangeable. I'm gonna do the same thing, and I'm okay with NC State. I'm gonna go to the other side though, and I know they're not a big, you know, big odds. They're the favorite. I think Miami is far and away the best team on the coastal side, and you're still getting plus money for them to win the coastal. I think that Pittsburgh's going to take a big step back. I don't really know what to make of Virginia and North Carolina. I'm a huge Van Dyke fan. I like what Miami's doing. I think Miami firmly represents that side. I don't mind backing them for the conference, but Miami is a team that I'm buying on in their win total, and I'm definitely looking at them in conference, plus 550 or plus 150 just to win their side. I love Miami to win the Coastal. Again, they're going to run into a strong team from the Atlantic in the ACC Championship, whoever it is. Clemson's on the Atlantic. If NC State knocks them off, they're probably pretty strong too. The same can be said about Wake Forest. But plus 150 to win the Coastal is a great number here. Like you mentioned, there's a ton of questions in the Coastal this year. Pittsburgh lost their quarterback, lost Addison, lost their OC. Virginia's undergoing a coaching change. North Carolina lost their quarterback. And then Virginia Tech and Georgia Tech are horrific teams. So it... (laughs) It's pretty. It's a pretty solid bet for Miami to come out of the coastal. I really like them. I think their only obstacle is going to be North Carolina, and North Carolina is a very tricky team to evaluate this year with the loss of Sam Howell. They have really good players essentially at every other position. So to me, it comes down to can they replace the quarterback and get at least a fraction of that production. Luckily, Jacoby Criswell is a former four star from the 2020 class. He was the number dual th- eleven dual threat in that class. And he's one of the better quarterbacks they've recruited in the history of their program. Again, we don't know this. It could be Drake May as well, who's another four-star, another really high-profile recruit. Those guys are going to battle each other, and there's a chance that neither of them are very good. And either way, they're both very young, so I think Miami has an experience edge over them. But I would place maybe a mini hedge on North Carolina, plus 600 in the Coastal. I like Miami a lot to come out of there, though. Yeah, I I think Miami's got far less question marks and – Again, it, you know, these are teams that there's a lot of variance within them. We will see. But Miami gets UNC at home this year. I think they're going to win that game. Uh, if they do that, they will have direct control of that side. So give me the Hurricanes to be a buy low team. What else you got? I know you said throw the SEC out. Are there teams in the Big <laughs> Ten? Are there, you know, secondary teams? Who else do we want to take notice of before we bounce on out of here? Yeah, so I'll briefly mention the Pac-12. I don't think the Pac-12 is a great conference to bet in terms of basically the conference championship. I would either just take USC plus 200 or move on. I think Utah is really the only other team that's competing with them. You have Oregon plus 290. I don't think a Bo Nix let Oregon's even lie for this. So to me, I would either just bet USC plus 200 or Utah plus 260 or maybe a sprinkle on both because I think you probably are going to profit in that situation. Nobody else outside of Oregon is even inside plus 900. So Can I just ask you real quick, do you have any interest in UCLA? So I broke them down. They're actually a team that is returning a decent amount of production on offense. I think their defense is going to be much worse, though. So okay. That's a problem for me, but, you know, it's tough. They're also limited in offense because Dorian Thompson Robinson is basically a dual threat, and he lacks the passing upside to really get it done, in my opinion. So UCLA is a tough bet. I thought I would like them more plus 900. I actually don't. Again, on defense, only two starters are turning. That's that's pretty bad, especially when you're going to be trying to stop USC and probably Utah now. So not too much interest. Arizona, 250 to one. Uh, I bet Arizona already in week one. But uh, who are they playing? Little Sisters of the Poor? It better be someone real. Let me let me tell you who they're playing. I can just look it up. Let's see. Arizona football. This is what people really want to know, obviously. How the hell they got in the show, I'll never know. They play San Diego State. Oh, those are two teams moving in completely opposite directions. Arizona's going to be better this year. Much better. They got a ton of transfers coming in. San Diego State lost all their good players. Oh, my God. Last time I bet Arizona, I'm not exaggerating. It was against Arizona State, and they legitimately fumbled 10 times in the first half, and I had to turn it off. Uh, that's not going to get it. Done. It, it. It's been rough, but I'm not a big San Diego state guy. So I got it. Let me ask you, I think the perfect way to close this out. And again, if you have questions, if there are teams that we missed at Matt underscore, Gajeski, you should be following this guy just for his hot dog takes. I have a lot more money than I did just a couple days ago because I watched that video. You can follow me if you want at jazz Raz, DFS real quick. And then you can, you can throw in a couple more teams, but I want to ask you about Cincinnati. 
They still are the favorite in their conference, but you've got Houston and UCF right on their tail. SMU, Memphis, I don't really see them getting in the mix. Do you think, simply put, Cincinnati is still the team to beat there, or are they behind teams like Houston? I think they're the team to beat, albeit slightly, and that's not reflected in the odds. So so much of what happens with them is going to come down to how they re- replace Ritter. The highest recruit in their program history is their now presumed starter, Evan Prater, at quarterback. But we talked about this lot a lot last year when we had new quarterbacks. Even if he fails, they're returning all five starting offensive linemen, and they have an, an LSU transfer and Corey Kiner at running back. I think they just probably fall back on what we saw early in Ritter's career, which is mainly a ball control offense that's going to live through efficiency on the ground. Again, even in their own conference now, I'm not sure that's going to live up to expectations because you have pretty explosive offenses in SMU and Houston. So if they get into a shootout and Prater's just not what he was billed to be as a four-star recruit, what happens to them? And I don't know that they have the offense built for shootouts. That's going to be a problem against Houston. They're my favorite bet in this conference overall. Houston's this team that's gotten much better. They're returning high-profile starters on offense. Clayton Toon's back. They have pretty good starters at running back. I, I wish McCaskill was there. He didn't wish he didn't get hurt, but they still have Tazan Henry, former Texas Tech transfer. They got Brandon Campbell from USC this offseason. Nathaniel Dell is back. Christian Trey in at tight end. They have a lot of transfers at receiver, and they actually got some pretty high-profile recruits at that position. Matthew Golden's a guy that could start immediately, I think, four-star receiver. Offensive line is going to be solid. Three returning starters, two good transfers, and then on defense, six returning starters, but multiple players have starting experience. It's similar to what we saw with like an Oklahoma, where because of injuries, a lot of their backups got time on the field. So we, on top of the six full-time returning starters, you have four or five guard guys that started a game here or there. So I, I love Houston. I think they're a solid bet to win this conference. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Cincinnati, I think they're going to take a step back. They lost not just their quarterback, but, you know, that secondary, which ultimately wasn't able to do much when it mattered. But still, uh, even in their conference this year, I think they will be tested by several teams, particularly Houston. So I'm with you there. But let's as we close it out here, let's go all the way back. If you want to recap, where would you put your money? Natty conference, couple of your favorite bets. I think the best bets to win the Natty are USC and Oklahoma at 30 to one and 40 to one. It has nothing to do with Alabama, Ohio state and Georgia. I think those are excellent teams. Their, their lines are just a little bit rich. Like I don't want to lock up Alabama at plus plus one eighty for nearly nine months of the calendar year. So for me, I'm going to take long shots with USC and Oklahoma. And that comes down to their path to the playoff. They both have very clear paths to get there. And then you just need an upset victory or two once you're there. And then from that position onward, I think NC State is a strong team to back in the ACC overall plus 1,000. If they knock off Clemson, they have a pretty easy path to getting there. And then the ACC coastal side is much weaker. But if you are going to back someone in the coastal, I like Miami just to win that side plus 150 solid bet there. We just hit on the AAC, Houston plus 240 solid, UCF maybe won't get into it, but plus 360 is a team with a ton of returning production. And, you know, one last spot I kind of want to mention briefly here in the Big Ten We didn't hit on the Big Ten West, which is maybe the weakest division out of any of the conferences. From that side, you have Wisconsin actually plus 170, which is a bit surprising. But I think that's kind of for good reason with a surging Nebraska. Plus 300 for them. They added a ton of transfers. They were already pretty strong on defense. And they're a team that ran historically bad last year. Three and nine. Unbelievable finish for a Nebraska team who essentially lost every single game that they lost by single digit points. They were more likely to finish 10 and two than three and nine. If you were to simulate out their season, which is ridiculous. And when you make that bet, you also don't need them to beat Ohio state, Penn state, Michigan on the other side to win the big 10 championship. All you need is them to knock off the teams on their side of the conference and Nebraska plus 300, I think is pretty live to do that against Wisconsin who has questions at quarterback, Iowa, they lost a ton of production. And then from there, it's just Purdue, Minnesota, Illinois. They outgained their opponents last year. That's just unheard of. Unheard of. With, I mean, this is it for Scott Frost. I know I say that every year, but they should be much better. Nebraska's maybe my favorite win total on the board. We talked about that in an earlier episode. So I like it. You throw out Illinois, any of the teams I think could win the West besides them. So it is wide open over there. I'm with you on all that and more. Again, we are going to circle back before the season starts with all of these things. See how the odds have changed. 
you've got some uh, some things to do, some bets to possibly lock in in the meantime. Again, I want to give a special shout out to BetMGM for power in the show. Go over there. Take that $200 and put it to good use. No reason not to do that. But for me, for Matt, for everyone here at Odd Shopper, good luck. Enjoy the offseason and college football creeps closer and closer every week. We will be back next week with another episode of Betting You. See you then.